I, I don't want to just cover this. You know, have your three points a poem and then go home and then, you know, you didn't understand or get what's there. Because the key to teaching is for you to understand what's going on. So I, that's, what, that's what I'm trying to do here. I want you to understand the principles of Christian liberty. Last week we looked at that the first thing we should consider as the Bible talks about, don't let anybody judge you in your Christian liberty. Don't let anybody judge you in your Christian liberty. Um, and the same time as we're going to look at a little bit later, don't use your Christian liberty as an opportunity to shove it in somebody's face. Christian liberty, here's the key to Christian liberty. Christian liberty is not the freedom to do what you want. It's the freedom to do what He wants through your life. That's the key to it. So that's why it's important. Don't let your good be evil spoken of. Someone would look at that verse and say, well, I've got Christian liberty. I can do what I want, so it doesn't matter. No. Don't let your good, something that's good to do, be evil spoken of. What does that mean? That means someone might not understand that's a Christian liberty yet. They might be truly struggling with growth in their life, and they look at that, and you, when you do it and shove it in their face, you're hindering them. Because they're looking at you and thinking they're seeing a hypocrite. And they, don't, they haven't grown to understand the true freedoms they have in Christ. So they might be listening to some legalistic background, and they look at that thing or whatever it is you're doing. It's not like Al Betancourt came to my house to play pool. I had a pool table in my room. It was a garage. So I had a pool table in my room. Well, he, his environment where he grew up, pool is immediately associated with drunkenness. Pool is immediately associated with brawling. Pool is immediate because his dad was involved in all of those things. In fact, that's why Al died. One of the most spiritual guys I'd ever known in my life came home from Bible college, got in his dad's car. His dad was drunk. His dad got in a wreck. His dad was okay. Al died. So when he came to my house and he saw that pool table, man, he was shocked. He was shocked. So I never played it when he came to my house. I had, I had the table over it, but I would talk to him and help him understand that pool, playing pool in itself is not wrong, but people can use it for wrong purposes, and we had all these conversations. And time went by, and he ended up playing pool with me. Where I could have just shoved it in his face early on, and he would have thought he was spiritual by getting away from me. And I wouldn't have been able to help him through that process. So, don't let people judge you in your Christian liberty. But at the same time, don't shove it in people's face. Understand, people are at different levels of spiritual growth. We... So misunderstood in the body of Christ. You get saved, you're a babe. And you know what? You can be a babe for 30 years. You can be a Christian that is constantly only able to digest the milk of the Word of God for 30 years. You can. But then we're to grow, and, and, and a baby starts getting a little bit firmer food, gets bread. That's what the Bible's called, milk and bread. And then what's the third? Meat. Milk, bread, and meat. That's what the Bible is called. So we are to progress people through the milk of the Word. Then they can get, understand the bread of the Word. And then they can understand the meat of the Word. But we got churches loaded with Christians that have been saved 20, 30, 40 years. that are still babes and little children. And we're trying to give them meat. And they're choking on it. <coughs> That's why equipping people, helping people understand the Bible takes time. Just like raising a child. You, you, don't, you don't birth a baby and give them meat when they come home. No, it goes through a process. And that's, of course, the spiritual process is, can be quicker, can be, quicker than the physical process of growth. Although some Christians string out that physical, spiritual process of growth about the same time frame as the physical. So, secondly, we must realize uh, there is nothing unclean itself. Look at verse 14. We're going to read verse 14 and 17. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, and we know that was the law, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them. We know that happened when he rose from the grave and snatched the keys of death and hell from Satan. That was the, that was the victory punch. And that was the death blow for Satan. And now Satan knows he's a lost he has lost the, the war, but he tries to win the battles in individual lives. He tries to win the battle of keeping the church immature and thinking selfishly and thinking about themselves 
instead of growing and realizing when we gather together, yes, there's times it's about me because I, I, I'm frustrated, I, I've had a bad week. Yes, sometimes it's about me, but more than not, I'm, I'm, when I gather, when we gather, I'm trying to minister to other people. I'm trying to be a, a blessing to them. It becomes less about me and more about other people. And then 16, let no man therefore judge you in meat or drink or respect him on a holy day. This is going to take a couple weeks to go through this verse. Respect him on a holy day or the new moon or the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. So we must realize there's nothing unclean um, of itself. In Christian liberty. Look at Romans 14, 14. We're, gonna, we're talking about this principle of Christian liberty. So turn to Romans 14, 14. Romans 14, 14 says, I know. And that word, that word know in the Greek is an intimate term. I know and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself, but to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. Okay? So unless the Bible specifically says that is a sin, we're to stay away from it. But what Paul, remember what Paul's having to deal with here, is we're going from the law to the church age, and there were certain dietary restrictions that they'd had for generations, hundreds of years, the Jewish people, and now because Jesus died and he, he, he was buried and arose again, that part of the law was done away with. They no longer had the dietary restrictions. Man, they couldn't eat certain types of food. They could. I mean, we can, we can read it now, but you can go back to the law. There was an awful lot of types of but fish, fowl, cattle, pigs. They couldn't eat. But when Jesus died and rose from the dead, that handwriting of ordinances that was against us was contrary to us. He took it out of the way because he paid the price. Now, I do believe if we look at those items that he said don't eat, I think if we look, I know because I've done it. If we look into them, they're not good for you. It's not a sin to eat them. Bacon? I'm sorry, Connor. It's not a sin to eat bacon, but it's certainly not good for you. Okay, clogs up your arteries. It does all these bad things. Catfish? Okay, not a sin. But, he, but they couldn't eat catfish. Why? Because it's skills. God knew that, and it's a scavenger. It eats junk off the bottom. It eats, it eats dead bodies of people. And then when you eat a catfish, you're eating the leftover dead bodies. Okay, so that, that, well, that's what scavengers are. Shrimp? Can't eat shrimp. Scavengers. See? I mean, that's what I'm saying. That's what he's really keying on here. Because remember, he's talking to people who had been involved in the Jewish law, these handwriting of ordinances that was against them, and now they have freedom in Christ. Now we look at freedom in Christ a little different than they were looking at freedom in Christ, because they're coming out of these restrictions of the law. There were certain kind of clothes and material they couldn't wear together. They couldn't go a certain amount of distance from their home on the Sabbath, or they were sinning. There were so many handwriting of ordinances that they had to obey while looking for a Messiah that was going to come. They had to do both parts of that. We, we looked at that in Ezekiel chapter 3 a couple weeks ago. We don't. We've been free from that. But they, when, when Paul's speaking, they're thinking of the law. See, when we're, when we're thinking of Christian liberty, we're thinking about, hey, what can I do and get away with? Hey, what's free for me to do? You know? That's the kind of thing we think about. You know? But they're thinking about the law, the restrictions of the law. That's why he's saying, nothing is unclean of itself. That pig, it's not unclean of itself. That shrimp, it's not unclean in itself. But to him that esteemeth it to be unclean, to him it is unclean. You know what that means? If I think right now it's a sin to eat shrimp, and I eat shrimp, I have sinned. Because in my mind I believe it's a sin. We're going to look at a couple more passages to open this up a little bit further. So, you can restrict yourself as much as you want to restrict yourself legalistically. If the Bible doesn't expressly say something is a sin, you have Christian liberty to make a decision on that matter. But you need to be careful who's watching, because they might not understand that Christian liberty that you have, even today. We talk about some things in discipleship that you have Christian liberty to do, but you need to have moderation 
and that if you do it out of moderation, it becomes sin, that if you were to talk about openly in most churches, they would vote you out next Sunday. Because they have just been conditioned on certain legalistic matters. So, to him that esteemeth it to be unclean, to him, not to everybody else, this is, this is, but to him it now becomes a sin. Look at verses 2 and 20. Romans 14 and verse 2. For one believeth that he may eat all things, another who is weak eateth herbs. Well, because he doesn't know he's free in Christ. He doesn't know, he doesn't understand yet that those dietary restrictions of the law, they've been done away with. You know what? It takes discipleship. It takes building in people's lives. It takes helping them to understand the Bible that they don't become bound by things that they, they don't need to be bound by them. How many Christians are bound by so many things? I grew up in a church that had a sign on the outside. It says, women, women do not wear pants. And if you walked in with pants, they ushered you out. These restrictions that some churches still have on worship, it's totally unnecessary. In verse 20, For meat, for meat destroy not the work of God. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for that man who eateth with offense. If you know that your Christian liberty is offending a weaker brother or sister in Christ, you are sinning in your freedom. That's the responsibility of Christian liberty. So these churches that go out there and say, you know what, if you don't like it, lump it. We're going to do what we want. We don't care who it offends. Because we have liberty in Christ. Guess what? They're sinning. If they are knowingly offending. Now listen, a weaker brother or sister in Christ can be someone who's been saved 50 years. They just haven't grown yet. They've been going to a church. That they, every Sunday they get a gospel message. The milk of the Word of God. It's a, it's a milk. The gospel is milk. It's important. It's the starting point. It, it is vital to... We can't grow in Christ until we become a Christian. But that's milk. Any believer can say amen to a gospel message. But you've got churches out there that believe it's a sin if every Sunday you're not preaching a gospel message. But guess what? I don't have to preach a gospel message to put the gospel into the message. I've already put the gospel into this message, and it's not a gospel message. It's an expository message. But I've already inserted the gospel. And if you know how to understand the Word of God, you can do that. But every Sunday, just to have a gospel message where you can get a bunch of amens, because it's the responsibility of the pastors to equip and grow their people so they can go out and win people to Christ and then bring them into the body of Christ so they can grow and mature. So that's what verse is talking about. Be careful. Don't use your freedom when you know it has the, the, the direct effect of being a stumbling block to a weaker brother or sister. Now, if I've got some preacher over here that's judging me because of my liberty, I really don't care what he thinks too much. I'll talk to him. I'll try to help him understand it. But I'm not making him stumble. He's just being prideful or arrogant or whatever. But if I'm around someone who's truly offended, they don't understand what's going on here. And then Titus 1.15 says, Unto the pure, all things are pure. But unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure. But they, they take anything to make a sin out of it. But even their mind and conscience is defiled. You know, you got these computers coming up now with um, virtual reality. They've got it now where you can put the goggles on, and you can put the gloves on, and you can put the feet on, and you are literally experiencing the environment of what you're watching on the TV. You know, that's not a bad thing. But guess what? The pornographic industry is going to take that, and they're going to run with it. And they're going to take other industries, and they're going to take that and run with it. And what is pure, what, is, what it means is not sinful, they're going to take that and make it sinful. Because that's what corrupt minds do. That's what defiled minds do. They take something that's not a sin, and man, they straight away try to figure out a way to make it a sin. And then here's what that means today. Romans, Romans 14, 1 through 6. Him that is weak in the faith receive you but not to doubtful disputations, which means help them grow. And if that person continues to be a stumbling block in your church, even when you're trying to help them grow, and they're becoming a stumbling block in the church and will not respond to your teaching, then you have to deal with them in church discipline, not with doubtful disputations. If they continue with it and continue to make it a church issue, and they're not buying into it, and they're trying to hurt the church, and trying to stifle the church, not allow the church 
to operate under Christian liberty, which is what Christ died to give us, with responsibility, they're to be ushered out of the church. For one believeth that he may eat all things, another is weak, eateth herbs. Let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not, and let him not him which eateth not judge him that eateth, for God hath received him. Now let me stop there. When I was discipling Dean, and I told you this before, but I want to kind of illustrate the point. He's, he said, I haven't gone to a movie since I was 16 years old. He said, it's just a decision I made. And I said, well, Dean, I, I go to movies. I'm trying to, I try to be careful when I go to movies, but I go to movies. He goes, hey, that's between you and God. That's exactly what that verse means. It's exactly, he made a decision not to go, but he's not judging you because you do go. Now, if I went to a pornographic movie, he would have every right to say, hey, Mark, you know that movie thing we talked about? You've got to deal with something here, parent. Okay? So, he, he was totally living that perfectly. And then verse 4, it says, Who art thou that judgest another man's servant on things that are pure, on things that are not sinful in the Bible? To his own master he standeth or falleth. Yea, ye shall be holden up, for God is able to make him stand. One man esteemeth one day above another, uh, 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 another esteemeth every day alike. Every, let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. Now, now this, this is like Easter. I don't judge someone who celebrates Easter. I don't judge a church that celebrates Easter. But I am trying to get the word out. I'm fully persuaded that Easter is a pagan holiday and that the Passover should be what we celebrate. I'm fully persuaded of that. And I will debate someone till the cows come home that Easter is pagan and the Passover is the true reflection of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. But I'm not going to judge a church and say that they're not right with God. And I'm not going to judge a person and say he's not right with God because they celebrate Easter. They, honestly, from my heart of hearts, they just haven't grown to understand the, the paganism of Easter. They have not, for some reason, looked into the history of Easter and found out that Easter was here a long time before Jesus Christ ever got on this earth, and the pagan goddess of fertility and sexuality was here a long time before Jesus ever came, and her name, and, the, and that Easter is named after her. Okay? So, that's what we're talking about here. One man esteemeth one day above another, another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. So yes, persuaded, I'm going to do everything I can to discuss the point. I've even got a website out there, Passover Takeover, where I'm trying to get people, and I do, I have, I have quite a few already, who are trying to get the word out that the Passover is a true reflection of Jesus Christ. And every year, we're going to push this thing till the cows come home, but not judge them at the same time. Verse 6, he that regardeth the day, regardeth it unto the Lord. And he that regardeth the, uh, not the day, the Lord, he, the Lord, he doth not regard it. And he that eateth to the Lord, for he giveth God thanks. And he that eateth not, to the Lord he eateth not, and giveth God thanks. Basically, it's going back to verse um, 5. You do what you believe is right in your own heart. And as the first point said, don't judge another person on their liberty. That's the responsibility of it. But yes, get involved in all kinds of debates to help people understand the true nature of Christian liberty. The church has no authority to decide matters of Christian liberty. Things not forbidden in Scripture. I have no right to tell you you can't go to a movie. I have no right to tell you you can or can't do anything that's not expressly forbidden in the Word of God. Can, I, I have no right. That's the Holy Spirit's job. My job is to teach you how to understand the Bible. My job is to grow you into a spiritual adult. It's your job to respond to the Holy Spirit. That's not my job. Nowhere in the Word of God does it say it's my job to be a spiritual policeman. It says I'm to be a shepherd. In Ephesians 4, I'm to equip them in the work of the ministry. Romans 14, 10-12. But why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set at not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. All meaning the church. From the resurrection of Christ until the rapture of the church, only those people who are believers will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And he's saying, every one of you are going to stand before Jesus and at the judgment seat of Christ, your works, what, you, what we're talking about here, will be exposed as wood, hay, and stubble, 
Gold, silver, precious stone. Your good works. Not your bad works. Your good works. So if someone went to church their whole life and never wore pants to church and they only did it to make their pastor happy, when they get to heaven, that good work is wood, hay, and stone. It counts to nothing. Because we know that our good works are going to be judged by the only two things that are eternal in this life. The Word of God and the souls of men. What do they do with the Word of God as it impacts the souls of men? And gold is the glory of God. That's our motive. Why did we do it? Silver is redemption, telling people about the redemption of Christ. And precious stones all through the Bible are people. Gold, silver, precious stones. That's the judgment. And that's, that's, that's Christian liberty in a nutshell. Because what I do or don't do affects other people. That's, that's why the Christian liberty has such a huge responsibility and privilege. Because it, it affects people. When I'm around people, is that increasing their desire to know more about Christ, or is it decreasing it? Because the Bible says we're to be salt of the earth. Salt makes people thirsty. Salt makes people want what you have, water, the water of the Word of God. So we will give an account for our responsibility of Christian liberty, and it will be based on our understanding of scriptures. That's where Satan's winning the battle. In a majority of the churches, Satan is winning the battle because they come to church and hear messages every time they walk through the door, but they really don't understand it. They really don't understand it. I, I, I give this illustration before, but my sister was in a Bible college. She grew up in a Christian school, grew up in a leading independent fundamental Bible uh, believing Baptist church. And she got a job at a uh, uh, department store her first year of Bible college. And one of the girls that were working with her was homosexual. And the girl came up to her on lunch break and said, you know, I'm homosexual. But I'm struggling with it and I want to know if it's really right or wrong. Can you help me with that? You said you're a Christian. And although my sister had grown up in the church, went to Christian school her whole life, she could not use the Word of God in a way she could not go in. She couldn't explain to this girl from the Scripture, verse on verse, let me, okay, let me take you here. This, this is what the Bible says about homosexuality. Here's another passage. Here's what it says. She, she did not have the ability to do that. And she'd been going to a leading Baptist church for 20 years. <clears throat> Romans 14, 14 through 23 is the key. And I know and persuaded by the Lord Jesus Christ there is nothing unclean of itself, but to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. But if thy brother be grieved with thy meat, now walkest thou not charitably. Destroy not him with thy meat for whom Christ died. Say, quit eating in front of him. If it's truly offended him, stop. Now when he's gone, eat all the meat you want. But when he's with you, don't eat meat. That's what, Until he understands what's going on, don't eat the meat. Because Christ died for him. And don't use your liberty. Don't say, my eating this steak is more important than you getting saved or having a relationship with Christ. So that's selfish. So we should just don't eat it. And then it says in verse 16, Let not then your good be evil spoken of. That's in context to this whole chapter. Don't let your good be evil spoken of. For the kingdom of God, that's the invisible spiritual kingdom. The kingdom of heaven is the visible and spiritual kingdom. The physical and visible kingdom. The kingdom of God is the invisible and spiritual kingdom that John 3 says you can only see when you accept Christ because He gives you spiritual eyes. Okay, That's the only way you can see the kingdom of God. For the kingdom of God, the invisible and spiritual kingdom, is not meat or drink. Okay, It's not in what you do or don't do. It is in righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. The kingdom of God, out beside that one, you can put the kingdom of God is spiritual, not physical. The only way you can show someone else the kingdom of God is by living a righteous life. It's the only way they're going to see it. For he that in these things, the, the, the spiritual things, Serveth Christ is acceptable to God and approved of men. Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace and things wherewith one may edify one another. That's why discipleship is so important to this church. That's what edifies. It's not that legalistic thing that causes judgmental attitudes. I'm better than you because I didn't, you know, eat a T-bone steak. I only ate a sirloin. You know, whatever the judgment is, we don't have that. 
For me, for me, destroy not the work of God. What, let me translate. For Christian liberty, destroy not the work of God. For things that are okay for you to do, don't destroy the Word of God. Do them in a situation where it can be unbeneficial. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for that man who eateth with offense. Wow! How many pastors fit that right there? It is good neither to eat flesh, nor to drink wine, nor anything whereby thy brother stumbles, or is offended, or is made weak. Hast thou faith? Have it to thyself before God. Happy is he that condemneth not himself in the thing which he allowed. Now here's one of the keys too. And he that doubteth is damned if he eat. Because he eateth not of faith. For whatsoever is not of faith is sin. What that means is, if I go somewhere, or do something, or look at something, willingly, that I'm not sure whether it's a sin or not, it has just become a sin. Because I did it doubting. God says in the Bible in Romans 14, Christian liberty, the mandate of Christian liberty is you should know and be persuaded by the Lord Jesus Christ that there's nothing unclean itself. If you, if you aren't sure that this thing that you're getting ready to participate in is not a sin, don't do it until you are fully persuaded in your mind from the Word of God that it is okay to do. That is the responsibility of Christian liberty. Never just believe what someone says just because they say it or how much you look up to him or how much you respect them. Study it. Look into it. And then be fully persuaded, that means you've looked into it, your own mind. And the Bible says that verse 22, happy is that person that doesn't consent, condemn himself or is not doubting, oh, is that a sin or not? Well, I can do it. No, no. Make sure before you ever do it. But make sure that your persuasion has become from the Word of God, okay? That's, you need to make sure that this is the basis of your persuasion. And then do it. And, and don't care what... You know, do it. It is not a sin. Don't feel bad about it. And the only time you don't do it is if someone doesn't understand that that's a Christian liberty and you want, don't want to be a stumbling block in front of them. Know why you believe what you believe and be biblically convinced of it. How many people live life with doubts all the time? I mean, it's, it's out there, all over the place. Not just doubting your salvation, which should never happen to a mature believer. Hey, I have never doubted my salvation. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not special. But not doubting your salvation just comes with maturity and understanding that the Word of God says what it says and means what it means. And I don't doubt it. I, I've never doubted my, Not one time in my life I've ever doubted my salvation. An immature believer doubts their salvation. And we need to get to the place where we're a young man, we're able to overcome the wicked one. That's what a young man does. And we're, when we're a young man and we're able to overcome the wicked one on a daily basis, then that next step becomes becoming a soul winner. And then taking them through the first five levels of spiritual growth. And then you become a spiritual leader. You're an elder. Because you're now one people to Christ and you brought them through that. And then once you become an elder, then the last stage is now your, your vision is becoming worldwide. God is opening up avenues for your vision to become worldwide. And that's available to every believer. And then we'll close with this. The application of Christian liberty to life and living is a matter of the heart. Look at Micah. 6, 7, and 8. Micah. It says, Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams or with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? You know what he's saying? Some people think, this will make God happy. You know what? I'll give God a thousand rams. I'll give Him a, a ten thousand rivers of oil. I'll give Him my firstborn. God will be happy with that, won't He? Verse 8. And this used to be a song way back when. He has showed thee, O oh man, what is good and what the Lord requires of thee. And it goes on. I'm killing it. But that used to be a song, Praise 4, used to put to music. 
He has showed thee, O man, what is good and what the Lord doth require of thee. Here's what he requires. But to do justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. God's not looking for us to take a whip when we sin and lash ourselves over the back 50 times and draw blood. And that proves that we're sorry. He said, no. Do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with thy God. That word showed, he hath showed thee, O man. Remember, that is you are the example. You're not pointing to someone else as the example. Good. He showed thee what is good, what is beautiful, what is best, what is bountiful, what is favorable, what is fine. He has showed thee, O man, what is good. That's the word of God. This is where he showed it to us. The Bible is the revelation of what is good. So what is Christian liberty? We'll stop here. So far we've learned, don't let others judge you for your Christian liberty, but take responsibility in that Christian liberty. And two, realize there's nothing unclean in itself. Nothing is unclean in itself. And then next week we'll start on third. We'll learn what these verses in... Colossians mean about shadow of things to come, the physical aspects of the law are going to come back into play after the rapture. Not now. They were in play before the rapture. They're not in play now, the physical aspects. But they will come back into play because there are shadow of things to come. They're going to come back into play during, partly during the tribulation and then full-blown in the millennial kingdom during the physical uh, reign of Christ, which is the kingdom of heaven on this earth. So, I hope that's given you a good foundation of Christian liberty. Such a, such a privilege, but it is a great responsibility. And we have Christian liberty to do what God wants, not what we want, so that we can make a difference in people's lives. Let's pray.